Hello and welcome to Streamers and Punches, the podcast from Sound Notion TV that looks at current events and new releases in the world of film music. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wall. And on today's episode, it's very cool, we've got Julia Newman, who, even though she's a film composer, is not related to the Newmans, but is still a film composer nevertheless. She's going to be joining us a little bit later on for our interview, and we'll talk about some current events, uh, some films that Kevin and I just recently saw, uh, saw. In fact, one we saw together, and we're going to talk about that, and then a couple other things that are very cool. Um, so first up, uh, Variety has an interview with uh, Fargo composer Jeff Russo. That Kevin, that would be Fargo, the new TV show, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah, have you had a chance to check the show out? You know, I, I watched the first couple up, like first episode or two, and it was pretty good. I just never got a chance to to finish up the rest of the season. Uh, and they did just announce, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that they've renewed it for a second season. Um, but it will be have a pretty much completely different cast, and focusing on, um, I think maybe one or two characters that were in this season. But like, okay, I mean, this season they had you know. Martin Freeman and Billy Bob Thornton mm -hmm. and a couple of fairly famous, fairly busy people um, who it sounds like are not going to be in the next season. But anyway, hopefully okay. Jeff, Jeff sticks around. You know. Okay. Uh, looks like Alexander Desplat is busy in Venice. Yeah. Uh, it was announced, I think a couple of weeks ago that he um, will be heading the jury of the Venice film festival. So Wow. I, I can't imagine it's very often that you have a composer at the head of something like that, so that can be kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and Hans Zimmer is also going to be honored at the Zurich Film Festival, so there are your couple of pieces of film festival news for the day. I think the takeaway is if you're from Europe and you do film composing in America, then you get to go back to Europe to collect awards. It's certainly what it seems like. There were, yeah. Uh, so, so for our audience, do that. <laughs> right. Yeah, just, just do all those things. <laughs> Pro tips with Bill Witham. Um, right, right. Well, I recently saw Better Off Dead, which is a fantastic 80s comedy, and there was a great line in there where this guy is telling another guy how to ski downhill. He says, go that way, really fast. If something gets in your way, turn. And that's it. That's it. That and it's, like it's, word, it's words to live by. <laughs> it's just great. Anyway. Uh, okay, so we're going to maybe talk about the Planet of the Apes prequel a little bit later on, but mm -hmm. you can listen to a bit of it online. We do have a link for that, uh, which, of course, I'm not sure if the link will have all the track titles, but we do have a separate link so that you can read some of the track titles for Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. And, Kevin, did you like the track titles? You know, it, for for those of our listeners who, who aren't familiar the titles on Michael Giacchino's soundtracks, the titles of all the tracks are usually puns. Um, and, we, you know, when it's like a Pixar movie or something, it can be kind of charming. I, there's, there's not really much in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes that's very funny. So it just it seems <laughs> It's going to be really next. awkward when he scores the next Tarantino movie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. When he gets his Schindler's List, it's going to be a little bit inappropriate. Um, yeah, I mean, even in Star Trek, he had, um, if you're a composer and you've studied anyone in the 20th century, you would know who Bella Bartok is. But yeah. there's a scene where Kirk is in a bar, and I think they get in a fight. So he called it Hella Bartok. Is it, is it bar okay. talk, like two words? Two words, and then Hella, like, is if you watch South Park, and you're like... Yeah. That's hella cool. So it's a big pun on Bella Bartok, but I don't think everyone would get that. And right, there, and, that's, and that's okay. I mean, yeah, part of the part of the charm of puns is when they fail miserably. That's that's kind of what <laughs> they do most of the time. Um, and actually, it's you know, I saw a couple of posts and things popping up on the internet where people, a couple of people were like, okay, you know, enough of the puns already. It's like. For the first couple of records you released, it was cute. Now it's just, yeah, just stop, please. Yeah, I don't know if the video game music he used to do had that there, but I, you know, ever since the big, the sort of blow up of Pixar, yeah, and uh, you know, like Speed Racer, and then uh, the, yeah, the, all the stuff he's on now, the Star Treks and the the J.J. Abrams stuff and Cloverfield, he's had, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, he definitely turns up the the pun charm quite yes. a bit. Uh, let's see. So tell us about this L.A. Museum of Art. 
Yeah, so this was just a couple of days ago. There was an event at the LA Museum Museum of Art. It was um, John Williams, Gustavo Santaolalla, and the LA film music director Gustavo Dunamel sitting around talking about film music. Um, sounds like it was kind of interesting. Now, Dunamel, you might ask, you know, why was he there? Well, he actually just scored um, a Venezuelan film. He's from Venezuela, and so he. Technically, he has one film score to his credit and talked a little bit about how kind of John Williams sort of served, not necessarily as an advisor, but, you know, helped him out a little bit with the mechanics of film scoring and all that kind of stuff. Um, So, yeah, we've got uh, a link to that article um, about that talk. One thing that I found uh, interesting was as part of the interview, uh, it was Tavis Smiley that interviewed them, I think. Uh, he asked each of them beforehand to come up with three three film scores that they felt were really you know good or really important that you know were none of their own. Um, so some of the answers were kind of interesting. I won't necessarily spoil them for you, but you can uh, check out that article on filmmusicsociety.org, and we'll have the link for you, of course, at soundnotion.tv slash sap. So I was going to make a rude comment that you know those three people were arranged because. Um, Dudamel would serve as like the 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 medium or the the kind of MC, and John Williams would serve as a person who does a lot in film scoring. So you can ask him like, how do you do a lot when you score a film? Like write lots of notes and write for lots of instruments. And then Gustavo Santaolalla would serve as, what do you do if you don't write very much notes or for very many instruments? And <laughs> so it's like two completely extreme examples of this how to true. I mean you you're talking about you know, between those two two very very different film composers absolutely. oh sure absolutely uh, and I don't mean that any with any disrespect with Gustavo Santolaya yes, uh, he's well no I mean he's got a gig and so you know more power to him but he he's got a gig, he's scored, got a couple of Oscars he scored yeah yeah well ask the film score monthly guys if he deserved those Oscars <laughs> but it's like uh it's like he would score entire films with just kind of strumming on a guitar but in certain cases that's all that film may have needed but i think he did a couple films in a row like that so it's like <clears throat> gustavo you've got some splaining to do <laughs> but anyway so two completely different approaches it'd be kind of interesting to hear what their comments were yeah um so what's the latest rumor on who's going to score the one of the next marvel movies kevin well we you know of course this this past couple of days and going into the weekend is the san diego comic-con So there's all sorts of movie and superhero stuff and whatever coming about. Um, Christopher Young, who um, has has been working for for quite a long time, but has scored the last couple of Sam Raimi films, uh, including Spider-Man 3 and and that kind of stuff. Um, He he himself is sort of of fueling a rumor that he's going to be scoring Doctor Strange, which is one of the new... um, Marvel franchise movies that they'll that are in this the next round the phase three stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess he has a connection to the either like the producer or the director of Doctor Strange from a project called Deliver Us from Evil, which I Bill, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm not. Um, but Christopher Young was the uh, the composer on that project, and so he was on a panel of film composers at Comic Con, and was asked about that project since some of his collaborators are working on it. And he basically said, well, yeah, I, I'm assuming they're going to hire me. I hope they hire me. And if they don't, I'm going to be mad. So according to Christopher Young, Christopher Young is going to be scoring Dr. Strange, which would be cool. I mean, he's, he certainly has chops and is uh, uh, an interesting composer when he's doing, uh, yeah, I always kind of like horror stuff and a lot of, he can, he can do some pretty out there kinds of things when he wants to. Um, I really like to score to uh, Drag Me to Hell, which was yeah, a yeah. uh, horror movie. It was really intense for a PG-13 horror movie, too. But it's that rule. As long as you have a lot of goo and it's not blood, then you can get away with a lot and not have it be R-rated. But he had a really cool, almost like uh, operatic, uh, classical horror kind of sound. Like big choir, organ, big orchestra. And just – it was fun. It was really cool. And solo violin was – Really, it just was great. It was great, fun to watch and listen to. Uh, and I always kind of thought of of him as kind of similar to friend of the show, Bruce Broughton. Like, completely, yeah. really good composer. Like, full of talent, full of ability for the film medium, uh, if not even outside of it. And then they just get overlooked. 
And yeah. it's just one of these people who should should be getting more phone calls, and for whatever reason, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'll be interesting. And Brian Tyler, um, who we've mentioned before, is scheduled for Avengers too. So that should be interesting, just to see yeah. again the variety of scores that Marvel gets for some of their upcoming films. So yeah. I mean, and it's it's interesting too because something that we've talked about quite a bit um, is that. The, these the big Marvel movies they haven't had great scores. Um, you know, Captain America had a, had a pretty good score with Alan Silvestri, and then his score for the Avengers was, you know, it was still Fun pretty good. But yeah. other than that, it's it's been a lot of really. It's been very natural stuff. Yeah, very exactly. generic. You know, actually, I think if this were the 1980s or the 1990s, and I know it's not, but if Alan Silvestri wrote that score for those movies, Wait, it's not. Then, even if the I movie, a lot of denim I need to get rid of. <laughs> even if uh, even if the movies were really good, but if it were they were released in the 80s, those scores would be, I think, really subpar. I mean, if you had. Yeah. We we you know we complain about James Horner, but if you take like the Rocketeer and Willow and Star Trek two and three, and then the, some of the political movies he did as well, uh, man, wow, I mean, political dramas. I mean, those are like like they're just rich scores with a lot of character themes and, and everything the, else. And I, I don't think it's Sylvester, even yeah. Sylvester's work. You know, Romancing the Stone and Back to the Future and uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and uh, I'm missing I'm missing one. Uh, he did one of the Young Guns movies, but well, anyway, it, yeah. it's just—it just seems like it's it's Sylvester, but not at his peak form. And yet, compared to Raymond Jawadi's uh, Iron Man one or or whatever, or or uh, John Debney's Iron Man two, that it stood above. But it would—it seemed like, but it's having to be compared to a lot less than what I guess what we would think would be stellar. Right, and, and I don't, I don't think it's just a, a decade thing. I mean, certainly, you're not going to get like a 1990s Danny Elfman Batman or Spider Man kind of score. But just, I mean, just compare the scores for the Marvel movies to the scores of the DC movies. It, I mean, cer- certainly, Hans Zimmer's music for Man of Steel and for the Dark Knight trilogy, um, it, it's. It's it has all the same kind of ostinatos and, and drones and all the same kinds of things that you hear in these Marvel films, but that stuff you can is still memorable, right? You know, if, if you take a cue from The Dark Knight and you play it for someone who is kind of a fan of film music, they'll be able to pick it out in a heartbeat. If you play something from the middle of, you know, Iron Man three, it's it, there's not much of an identity to it, I think, and that has been kind of the consistent thing with these Marvel movies. So it'll I'm be interesting to hear, you know, a Christopher Young take on a Marvel movie because, again, he seems like such a different choice compared to the people that have had scoring their other films. Well, I, I'm I'm cautious, cautiously hopeful, or cautiously optimistic because it's a refreshing choice, and yeah. and then with Ant Man. Edgar Wright was a refreshing choice as director, but then we saw what happened with that recently, right. unfortunately. But but hopefully uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed um, and hold out and, and see what happens with that. So that's very cool. Um, well, let's let that transition right into, like, Kevin, what uh, what cool things have you been listening to lately? So uh, the last couple of things that I've checked out, um, this is maybe a couple of weeks ago, I saw Chef, which is uh, John Favreau's new kind of little indie movie. He basically plays a uh, a chef working at a high end restaurant who gets fired and then redeems himself by opening up a, a food truck. Um, a lot of the film takes place in Miami because he's opening up a, f- a food truck with like Cuban sandwiches and things like that. Um, there's not really much of a score, if any, that I can remember. It's it's a all the music is source music, but it's a really really great collection of source music. So just. Okay. Between Cuban music and a lot of the different pop music and stuff he's got laced in there, it's worth checking out just just for that. It's like I said, it's not going to be a film score per se, but it's some pretty good stuff. Um, I also saw Edge of Tomorrow, which was the new Tom Cruise Emily Blunt movie. Mm-hmm. Then it's scored by Christoph Beck, and he's a composer we've talked about several times, particularly because his scores always seem to blend into the film pretty well, regardless of the style of the film. He's a very versatile composer. 
I, he's just one of those composers who the, the music is never going to jump out and kind of punch you in the face, which maybe isn't such a bad thing. Um, I saw Jersey Boys, which was Clint Eastwood's new movie about adapted from the Broadway musical about the Four Seasons, um, which it was kind of disappointing. Did you say that was like Walk Hard, but a serious version? Of- it was, which which kind of made it hard to take seriously because it was all <laughs> the same things that happened to Dewey Cox in Walk Hard, except it wasn't funny. <laughs> Um, and for anyone that doesn't know, that's that basically a parody movie uh, with John C. Riley, I believe. Yeah, and, it, and it, it, at the time like it was they make fun of they make fun of like every trope in the musician folk singer biopic. rise to stardom yeah. biopic. Yeah, at, at the time it was really making fun of um, Walk the Line. Yeah, Walking Phoenix about Johnny Cash, and then also the uh, Ray, Ray with Charles. Jimmy Fox playing Ray Charles. So he basically took all the bad stuff that happened to those two people mashed them into one movie, making fun of all of it. Yeah. And then Jersey Boys was a lot of that same kind of stuff, but not making fun of it. Uh, and for a movie that's supposed to be an, ad- an adaptation of a musical, the the only real music in it was when the, the band was actually performing. There were a couple of moments of that, like transitional score stuff, um, but they were pretty, pretty underwhelming, I thought. Um, the last thing that I saw most recently, and Bill, you know this because you were sitting next to me in the theater, was uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, scored by Michael Giacchino, um, which maybe we'll talk about that in a minute when you talk about what you've been listening to, because, of course, that's on yeah. you as well. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so just briefly, uh, in, a, in kind of like a thumbnail sketch, that one, I see uh, the, the Giacchino score for Planet of the Apes, pretty cool. Uh, I just finished... Sorry, everyone who's a Game of Thrones fan. I just finally caught up to season four. So now I know why everybody was Facebooking the Mountain and the Viper. And I know what it's all about now. Yay, me. But uh, but there was some really cool musical stuff that uh, that show has, you know, a main title now that everyone makes fun of or sings or covers. And if you don't believe me, just covers of that too. There's, very- there's like the Royal Scots Guards just did a brass band cover of it. Um, South Park has a very funny <laughs> inappropriate version of it and anyway so on and so forth and then there's a, some amazing low brass players in new york city that recorded a low brass version of game of thrones theme and the theme made its way into like the final couple episodes and they really uh went for a lot of colors that actually that like lord of the rings found successful like boy choirs or boy soprano solos with um like uh, children's uh, choruses underneath mm-hmm. and then did lots of strings, almost a very more uh, ethereal, well, kind of like a Howard Shore texture, kind of a sound aesthetic. And then normally the show doesn't do that. It's very subdued. And uh, and the main title is the most driving thing about it generally, except with a, an exception of a few set pieces here or there. Anyway, it was kind of notice- noticeable. So good job to uh, Raymond Jawadi and the musicians there. Uh, and then uh, recently I purchased a couple scores uh, by Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, I'm a big fan of his, but uh, wow. Goldsmith slappy, that's for sure. Uh, right, right. Uh, there were a couple that became recently available. One was called Night Crossing, which is, I want to say, a 1981, 82 film. Forgive me on that. I've got the booklet right here, and I probably should have opened it up to read it. But anyway, so here it is. But uh, fantastic score. It's just a lot of fun, kind of wonderful uh, late 70s, 80s Goldsmith sound. If you like that, if you know what that is. You would love that score. And then Deep Rising was um, a Stephen Summers film before The Mummy. So it was um, uh, kind of uh, – it was like their first collaboration. So big Hollywood spectacle. Uh, some some stars, not huge stars, but um, anyway. And so it's uh, kind of a horror sci-fi movie with a lot of action. And Jerry Goldsmith's score is kind of fun, very percussive and synthy. Uh, mm-hmm. So anyway, both are just fun to listen to. I found myself driving on more than one occasion – Long road trips made a lot nicer when I can listen to some Jerry Goldsmith Night Crossing in there. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, let's talk about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Sure. Um, how many prepositions can you have in a movie title? I think you could probably squeeze in a few more. At least two, right? Okay. <laughs> or prepositional phrases. But anyway, um, I mean, overall, like, w- it was a cool film. I was surprised yeah. with the first one. The second one, like, developed it. And... They took – I thought the movie breathed. It took its time with certain things and there were a few things that felt a little Hollywood or, or um, we have to have this thing happen now kind of. But 
but basically like the plot moved along and and you you know you feel your 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 heart your emotions kind of tugged in this way or that way but i was pleasantly surprised to see that what they were hinting at some of the larger character arcs that are really telegraphed a little too on the nose in the trailers and the advertising at least at least from what i saw from movie trailers were not actually and maybe that's a spoiler in itself but that the movie still had surprises i'll just leave it at that yeah. And I and I enjoyed those with uh, Giacchino's score. Uh, he, I'll say one thing: you heard it clearly, and it was not dialed in as a kind of electro um, drone, mm-hmm. arpeggiated D minor over and over in the strings, kind of like Hans Zimmer uh, remote control kind of approach. I didn't feel it had that at all. It was quite, uh, quite different, and uh, yeah. he used a lot of more interesting colors, a lot of xylophone and flutes that. Kevin, you and I discussed that a little bit right after. I wasn't yeah. sure if they all worked, but at least it evoked uh, – well, first of all, you just don't hear woodwinds that much in film scores anymore because everyone's afraid to use them unless it's a solo, you know, like um, like an emotional flute solo or something. So, uh, and, and even then, it's usually in like the that lowest, very breathy kind of octave. You know, I said to you when we left the theater – and like you said, it's he has these moments of – this unison xylophone flute stuff way up high. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much they worked, but I was very glad that he tried them because aside from like a really, really super high sustained like drone in the drink in the strings, no, nobody actually even writes in that register anything. Uh, and yeah. it's usually just low, like string ostinato baseline and then low, you know, kind of toms and other percussion that are also lower pitched. So there is kind of this whole frequency range that film composers just seem to be avoiding like the plague. And you're right. It's, it's where a lot of woodwind colors kind of live um, in that kind of mid upper treble sort of thing. Uh, So even if they maybe didn't work very well, it was, it was so refreshing and really kind of unusual to hear some like high piercing stuff that, that yeah. cut through the rest of the movie. Because, well, you know, when, when was the last time you heard a film score that actually had stuff that cut through like that? Yeah, I can't remember because now they're like, uh, it's like I can be cooler than you. And the way I be cool as a, <laughs> the way I be cool as a composer is to be not noticeable. So I can way more out notice my music than you right. can. So I'll make mine way more mid range to low range. I'll make it just hum, you know, just kind of like sustain. And I won't have too many rhythms. And then when I do, it's only going to circulate around a couple different harmonies and probably really just one. And then for a dramatic effect, it'll move to another harmony. And that's kind of Hans Zimmer in a lot of ways. And it's kind of like the it's kind of like the film composer equivalent of the kid you went to high school with who spent like a couple thousand bucks filling their trunk with a huge sound system to play nothing but bass lines. And you can hear them coming like two miles down the road. It's kind of like that. Sort of, but <laughs> well, um, and it's nice. So I mean, I, I, I applaud Giacchino. Like, wow! So he he sort of stretched it. The, I thought the score was really muscular and and cool in a couple spots. Yeah, um, he's and, definitely. And certainly, it, you know, it reminded me. We, you know, again talked about this as well. Mm-hmm. Something that I know we've said as a criticism of some of his film scores, especially some of his non Pixar movies. I don't think we're the only ones. Is sometimes they have a they have trouble getting past his TV background. They like they tend to sound like Lost or Alias or something like that. Um, this score, in a lot of ways, reminded me of his scores to either Land of the Lost or um, Mission Impossible 3, which were both, you know, much like Planet of the Apes, based on properties that come from the 60s and 70s. And so he's maybe harking back to that a little bit. Um so there were times in this in this score where yeah it kind of sounded like a big TV episode or particularly there were a lot of moments that sounded like they were from an episode from Lost because you have yeah. all these characters you know wandering through the woods and stuff like that but yeah again yeah. it's even though some of them maybe weren't super successful I'm still glad that he tried a lot of the stuff that he tried right right so I know we shared another thing where there was a couple swells you know he's building up to a big moment and then the scene changes and you get this editing cut. And what it reveals doesn't actually seem to be all that worthy of this huge musical 
lead up to it because it's like we hear the swell as a human being you intuitively feel like oh we're about to see something amazing and there were one or two times that the, yeah. that the reveal was actually a little bit deflating like that wasn't that should not have had that big of a buildup. Right. Now, right. so that's just me, but I mean, I still because I, I, have remember, those nitpicks. I remember agreeing with the exact spots that you were talking about. It, yeah, it, it seemed like there were one or two moments where it was almost maybe like a miscommunication between composer and editor or something. Because yeah, yeah, kind of build up to a big reveal. Yeah, and instead of revealing something, it just cuts back to the shot that it had already been on or something weird. Right. Like I mean, you you want a good reveal. Go to Star Trek First Contact at the beginning when it backs away from Jean-Luc Picard's eyeball and then continues to back away and 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 back away. And back away. I love how you're awesome. this. Did, did, you like, did you like those big budget special effects just now? That's, That's great. Courtesy of my chair with wheels on the bottom. Is your um, entire face CGI like Caesar the, the ape? Yeah, that's how I keep my young appearance. Yeah. Um, Anyway, but it's like it, it backs up until you see the entire Borg ship, and then you get this huge chord from, um, I think it's Jerry Goldsmith's son, Joel, that cued that scene. But then you get also in Don Matrix's score to, um, sorry, Don, Don Davis's score. Davis's. Don Matrix. Davis's. Yeah. We just need to call him Don Matrix because that's way that's, cooler. That's what he did. <laughs> Don Davis has scored to the Matrix. He's got a great, oh, very similar reveal, and it's a pullback. Well, anyway, anyway, I'm just, I'm just bitching. It's just that it was a cool score, and it did some things that we don't normally hear. And I don't mean to attack it because right. it was different. Right. It, I would, I was happy that it was different. I still think, well, you can be different, but like find a way to make me buy into all those color choices and those those um, music uh, swells and things like that. Uh, yeah. But anyway, anyway, th this is just opinion. I was happy that it was different, and and I applaud that he's given it as much an acoustic chance as possible. Not a lot of electronics and samples, or did not sound that way. Mm -hmm. It sounded it's mostly a very muscular group of live musicians playing through, and it makes more sense because Apes and the Planet of the Apes has a very primal, primitive kind of aspect to it. So it makes more sense that he would go with, say, percussion and live players. And, and not have it be too polished and too produced. So anyway, um, I'm yeah. cool. I'm out. That's all I need to say about Don, D-O-T-P-O-T-A, as it were. I, I think it's called Dot Poda. Dot Poda. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still laughing at that. I never saw it called that in any press media online or anything leading up to the opening. It was always, you know, the Planet of the Apes prequel or... Mm -hmm. well, cool anyway. kids call it Dot Poda. Dot Poda and Andy Circus's work as motion capture is just stunning. And I think you mean worth, AC. It's worth. <laughs> uh, well, that's actually AS. AS. Oh, but right. A AS's motion capture work is worth the price of admission and is as good as everyone is saying it is. So yeah, yeah. Kevin, any final thoughts on that? Nope. Okay. Well, next up is our interview with Julia Newman, film composer, television composer, concert composer, and uh, activist. For elephants in Africa. So, very cool. We were glad she could talk to us. And like I said, no, the joke is that she does not belong to the Newman family. Her last name is spelled with two N's. Well, she belongs to a Newman family. She be <laughs> just thank you, Dave. Just thank you, Dave. She belongs to a Newman family, just not the musical legacy. Perhaps her Newman family will have a new musical legacy all its own. Anyway, so without further ado, check out our interview with Julia Newman. So we're really happy to have Julia Newman on our show today. Julia is a composer for television and film and even concert music. So, Julia, welcome to our program. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you for asking. Well, no problem. Uh, not only is Julia busy with uh, especially the Bones television show um, that's got, um, oh, the actor's name totally escapes me right now, David Boreanaz, right? Yes. And um, Emily? No, they, they don't have very easy names to pronounce, do they? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. So she's very busy with that show, and we do want to definitely talk to her a little bit about that. But I should just let our listeners know that I met Julia. I had the pleasure of meeting her and working with her about 10 years ago at the 2003 ASCAP Film Composing Workshop in Los Angeles, where all of us were sort of uh, – there were about 15 composers. We were all kind of put in a box, and – yeah. And sort of, yeah, at various points, wined and dined in Southern California, but at other points, put to work. And 
and had to uh, create a cue, write some music, orchestrate it, and get the parts prepared and work with the Los Angeles musicians. And Julia, like all the other composers, everyone wrote amazing music. And Julia had a really cool cue as well. So it was just a lot of fun to to be able to touch base and see how people have um, grown and and gone into their careers in the last 10 years or so. So anyway, it's fun to catch up. So I'm glad wow. you were able to, to chat with us. Uh, so, so Bones, let's talk about that for a second. You just, okay. it was, I know we were trying to schedule you a little bit earlier, but you had just finished the season. And I was, I was, yes. And, and I, I was exhausted. And then I, um, I was actually, we had just got ready to, we were getting ready to move. We've been, um, adding a second story onto our house. So that's been a very big endeavor. <laughs> I can imagine. So it was. It's been an unusually busy hiatus for for Cody and I. Yeah, and so Cody is uh, your your. He's your man. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, I like how you put that very possessively. <laughs> I don't yes. know the right term. Marriage life he's partner. He's mine. He's been mine, and, and no one can have him. I've had. He's been mine since. Or early college days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, he is also, I believe, a composer in his yes. own right. Yes, that's, that's how we met at All right. USC. How, how sane is that around the household where it's two composers? I, you know, we get asked that all the time, and I, I think having two separate studios is the way to go. Otherwise, we'd be fighting over the, you know, when we get to use, you know, our equipment, and and we're both at it, you know, all day long. So, um, you know, it's 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 great, and just to have somebody else that understands what you do, and I, you know, I, I we listen to each other's cues and progress sometimes, and give each other feedback. So it's really helpful in that sense, and. Um, just understanding, you know, sympathizing towards each other about the business and creative process, et cetera. And, um, you know, just also the understanding of our, our very odd hours and long hours and unpredictability. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, 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 it, we're kindred spirits like that. And I, I think it's, it's been a really good thing. And it's, we both get work from home, so um, you know we'll meet up with each other on our lunch breaks and sit outside in the backyard and kind of deflate. So that that's how it's kind of been. <laughs> no, that actually sounds really good to have a, a way to relieve some stress in the middle of everything. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, so, and and just it's it's less lonely too when somebody else works at home as well. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Well, so going back to the TV show, what could you describe an average week if there's such a thing? Like how crazy the work schedule is? We generally get 5 to 6 days per episode and um you know, I'm I'm it's pretty much um hit the ground running as soon as it lands in your lap and um you know, I myself at you know, it, I have at least on the minimum 12 to 14 hour days on that on that show, you know, I just, it, re it requires a lot of precision, um, with, you know, working around the dialogue and, um, you know, with bones, there's a lot of different shifts in mood. You have, you know, there's, there's a scene where there'd be, you know, they're uncovering clues and then they shift into some comedic moments. And then within that, they'll even shift into romantic moments. So just being able to create a cue that seamlessly is going from one mood to the next, it takes, more time to do that kind of writing, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I it's, it's pretty, it, it's pretty involved until, um, I deliver. And I usually that the first four, four or five days I'll be writing. And then the last day is all about delivery. And that's just, um, prepping all of the, the cues for, um, the mixing stage, you know, just, just printing them all out into different stems and mixing it and, you know, um, delivering a pro tool session and stuff like that. Um, and you know, typically, um, Sean will, um, when a show comes, he'll assign to me what cues he wants me to do. And, and he just has me go at it. And then he gives me notes, um, like two days before delivery and I make some tweaks and then send it along and then that's it. So, um, the show is pretty much, 
um, almost locked by the time we have it. Sometimes it gets a little hairier. Um, certain episodes are more complicated on their end, so we'll end up having a rougher cut. And there's been times where we've had to retime our stuff, you know, only a couple days before it's due. So that that gets a little bit hairy sometimes. But we have an amazing music editor that's been really helpful in kind of streamlining the process a little bit more. So that that's been great, but um, yeah, it's intense. I mean, it's just you know that the 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 pace of television is so much faster than film, and you just you learn to be much more economical with your writing and methodical, mm -hmm. and um, you know the, doing episode after episode. It's been like this is going to be my seventh season now, and you just kind of accumulate tricks, you know, and. Um, you learn what works and what you can do quickly and what's acceptable. And um, it's kind of fine-tuning your process um, throughout the process of doing the, the show. Does the work schedule uh, kind of Im imitate, obviously, the TV season? So busy in the fall? Or are you, are you going to be busy in a couple weeks getting ready for the fall debut yeah, I mean, we we start up again mid mid August, and you know, I have some prep work to do for that. Just you know, updating my template, and um, you know, with the, and and getting some, you know, usually it's summers. I'm I'm just upgrading my software and stuff like that. But um, usually, you know, Sean will go in and do the spotting, or or sometimes, you know, that the music editor will do the spotting, and and um, it's. Sean lets me know when it's ready, he sends it along, and, and I look at the spotting notes, and I just get started, um, just like any episode. Mm -hmm, okay. Uh, let's see, Kevin, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, because you've been scoring this show for several years now, I'm wondering, not necessarily does it ever get easier, but do you kind of amass more and more of the musical language that you can kind of call upon maybe more quickly or more quickly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they definitely. They're, they, you know, but they, because there, there's certain. Um, it calls for similar s techniques or or certain types of cues. We we do tend to do over and over again. But um, I try to change the sounds around just to keep it interesting and um, to give it like a fresh take on on the DNA, as so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, in a sense, it does get easier just because you've done it so many times. Um, but Bones is also an interesting show, and they, they start to take things in new directions, which will challenge us to do things differently, too. And it's like it's kind of like when I listen back to the things we did season four, it's, it's, it's quite different in how we're doing it now. Um, you know, we're doing a little more broader strokes lately and much more subtle scoring where a few years back, it was a little bit more on the nose and, um, you know, like on, um, on the scenes where they're uncovering clues, we would have more hits on those things and accents to make sure the audience knows that there's a clue right there. We need to put a symbol <laughs> swish right on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we're not really doing that so much anymore. We're kind of like just, I think Homeland actually had quite an influence, um, not obviously on Sean and, and how he's he's looking at scoring, but the, the producers are a big fan of Homeland. So um, they were really liking the subtleties of that scoring, so they were wanting us to do things a little bit like that at times. Um, so it's been kind of an evolution, so it's not as, you know, repetitive you know, and they also also have these exotic episodes, as we call it, where they'll go to different parts of the world, or you know, they 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 did this one episode a few years ago in Texas at a circus, and we had to do um, a Bones score with like a circus Texan influence, so we had to integrate <laughs> that in. Um, so we, we 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 it's like seasonings is what we call it. Um, and that kind of makes it fun, you know, to just kind of add these different little styles within the Bones vernacular. So, and then we'll have other shows where it's like really intense, like the whole show is like a big, it's like 24 sometimes where, um, they're, 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 they f finally find a villain that they've been trying to get for many shows. And then it ends up being like a 24 episode where there's just like wall to wall 
like action music, you know. So it's it's just really a, across the board in terms of um, the difficult, you know, in terms of the demand. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. <laughs> Well, it's like uh, the show can kind of relax a little bit after a couple seasons because it's maybe built up the ratings so it, it's confident in its audience and it knows that yes. they get, you know, that they get certain um, insinuations and so you don't have to be so literal or obvious and you can kind of take a step back and, and, and maybe have it be uh, a little more, I don't want to say mature, but uh, maybe a little, like you said, a little more... So happy. Uh, the the show has been you know around so long and they're just they're tr they trust us and they don't have a lot of crazy <clears throat> feedback after we deliver so it's it's been really nice in that we've had a longer leash you mm -hmm. know and and um they're they're not they're not so nitpicky like you hear other producers being well that's yeah that's really good yeah and I caught some of Sean's work on Homeland uh -huh. where it's it's very you know um uh a lot of I don't want to say it's all drone. I don't want to characterize it by saying it's all drones, but it is very much painted in very broad brushstrokes. Um, and I've mentioned it before on the show. I really love the in the main titles. You get a little bit of the trumpet that signifies oh, yeah. the character's association with jazz. Right. But I mean, there, that's a little cool clue there. But but that's interesting that that one show would have a little bit of a influence. Kind of, uh, yeah, an influence. Right. Or, right. Totally. Um... You know, I think the but the difference with the the two is with Homeland, it's a lot more exposed, and um, you know, there's there's a, a also um, it breathes in a very different way. It's slower paced, and he's able to have these windows where he can do these subtle things that you really notice. With Bones, or it's a lot more faster paced, quicker cuts, snappy dialogue. You know, lots of shifts in the music. So. Um, you know, it, it's a different sort of technique, mm -hmm. but there are times where um, there are certain scenes that do lend themselves really well to that sort of technique. So um, it's just an interesting crossover. It's it's really that shows really a hybrid, I would say, of, of different things. Well, when you mentioned uh, Sean, um, uh, we were curious about how how does that um, is it a team and Sean's the the sort of leader or how does that work? Because that's um, that's different than some situations where we talk to other composers, and I think that's really cool. Well, um, Sean is absolutely the leader. You know, he hired me, and um, he also works with Jamie Forsyth as well. And we, we, the three of us started the show together and kind of crafted the, the sound together along the way. But really, the three of us work individually, mostly. I mean, we're all in our caves doing our thing. But, um, you know, Sean gives us guidance and, um, you know, through his feedback and discussions before working on certain scenes. And, um, you know, it, it's a collaboration in that sense. Um, but it, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. It's like we work independently, but not, you know, and... and um, through the years, our stuff has really unified more and more, um, you know, as, as we've gotten to know the show more and the, the, the DNA of the show and everything. Um, but he's, you know, throughout the years, Sean's been pretty hands off with me. Um, just we've just he's just kind of trusted me more and more. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just if someone goes to IMDb, it yes. has. Um, so you could brag that you worked with the Crystal Method because it's listed there. No, not really. I've I've <laughs> met one of the guys from that. The only time I've ever seen him is when we walked on the stage um, to get our ASCAP awards. Because uh. he, he so we just were like, oh hello, and then we shook hands, took our picture, and then left. You know, like okay. I I just don't see those those guys at all. Um, yeah, um, but no, I bragged that I, I work with Sean and that I'm on Bones. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. enough for me. And it's, I think it's more of it that the song stuff is more independent from the scoring. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. And then you mentioned the Pro Tools sessions and, and getting it you know done in a few days and then in the last days, like all delivery. Is it all uh, electronics and samples, or is there a moment where you do work in some live players near the end? 
Or no, is it- unfortunately, with with our with this show, it's all synth. There was there was a very rare occasion, um, you know, on an episode that a Japanese episode we did where we needed some live shakuhachi, which my husband actually plays. Um, so we recorded him, um, but it's just too fast a pace, and um, you know, it, it's it's become so part of the, the sound to have synthestrated sounds you know and they i just don't think i don't not i'm not sure they have the budget for it either Mm -hmm. so unfortunately no okay well maybe you can have a special anniversary show where the theme is the music is all played live or something that would be amazing you know i think that's a great idea i wonder if maybe the series finale if we would finally be able to do that that would be incredible <laughs> but I don't know when that series finale is going to be. We got renewed for a tenth season, which is great. Um, there, there's rumors it might be the last one, but we keep thinking that every year, and then it gets renewed. So we're very lucky. So has the show basically been the same two leads for nine years now, nine seasons? Yeah. In terms of the actors. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's been the same um, two leads, and actually, you know, the the people that work in the labs. It's, 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 there's like a handful of characters that have been the same throughout the whole nine years, and they're just very lovable characters. Um, and you know, it's really more um, the the the, the um, crime stories that occur each week are different, so they bring in different actors for those. Um, but um, you know, it's been a, a steady progression of, of Bones and, and Booth. You know, that I don't know if you guys have watched the show at all, but um, the first five seasons or so, you know, they, they were not a couple. And everybody knew they were in love with each other, but they wouldn't admit it. And the, 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 their, the people they worked with they were all encouraging them, like, come on, you guys, just admit it to each other. So it was all about their sexual tension and banter so we got to really have fun with that and then Emily Dejanel who plays Bones got pregnant and in real life and that accelerated the whole thing <laughs> of Bones and Booth getting together and we're like okay we got to do something here and work this in so <laughs> so season seven they got together it was a big risk we actually developed um themes for um Booth and Bones being to, like being together, you know, they had like their own sound for being together now, and um, that was fun to do. Um, so the risk worked; they they did a good job with it. The fan base stayed, um, and now they they're married in the show, and they have a, a kid, and you know, they just keep up the same sort of banter between the two of them, the same energy that we all love, um, but they're just in di- different circumstances. That's really uh, kind of fascinating because I know with older shows like Moonlighting, as soon exactly. As, yeah, yeah. As soon as it deflated the tension, yes. then the, the viewership went away. So that's first of all, congrats on renewal for a season. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Secondly, congrats that the show has got such a great uh, writing staff that they're able to like transcend the changing characters and keep adapting and keep the show fun. And then yeah. you guys are there making the show fun as well and fun to listen to. And I think they they must really understand their audience well. I think they they've got to do you know uh, polls or you know when they have the test screenings or something um, because they they seem to know how to work the audience um, to keep yeah. them interested. <clears throat> so that's a good thing. Yeah, keeps well, us yeah. working. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, yeah, it does. It does. At least until another another show comes along with uh, you know two bantering um, uh, female and male leads, you know, right, like, right. A, a crime scene environment or something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, I did want. And Kevin, did you have anything else about Bones you wanted to ask Julia? No. Nope. Nope. I wanted to actually go. So we're actually just going sort of like I was going to say back in time, but this is yeah. not not necessarily, but. Um, you did work. You did collaborate a little bit with James Newton Howard, uh-huh. and I remembered um, when I would see either I would see it on IMDb or I would see it in the end credits of a film and think like that was cool. I really need to ask Julia about that in the year, <laughs> you know, in the years since uh, uh, you know working with you that summer. Uh, right. I always thought, well, that's cool because I'm going to pick up this James Newton Howard film score and listen to it, and I'm yeah. wondering like where's where's Julia in in the mix of all of that? Got it. 
Well, it was my, it, you know, there was a handful of, of films that I got the pleasure of orchestrating on for him. Um, the Water Horse, um, Michael Clayton, and The Great Debaters. And, um, you know, there, there were a handful of cues um, that he, he basically threw me a bone and, and tested me out in a way. And um, it ended up working out really well. Um, and I got to go um, to London with him and his crew to record The Water Horse. And, um, you know, it was interesting orchestrating for, for him because so much of it is already very much fleshed out. You know, and it's more of um, maybe more like arranging, like because the the this you know when you when you know how it is with strings when you're you're recording them in you're you're kind of you're a pianist blocking in the chords, so it's it's more of just like um, dividing the strings up in a nice way and you know doubling things and so forth. But um, you know, it's a little bit um, challenging in that. Um, you know, as an orchestrator, you're not, we weren't given like the film for context and it was yeah. more of just keeping as authentically to his mock-up, but just making it way better, you know, um, just fuller and kind of painting it with a little more colors, but not straying too far. Um, and he was just very nice to work with and, you know, it was just it's such a pleasure to do and, um, that was definitely one of the highlights. Yeah. Well, I've heard Water Horse. That one's actually quite colorful because I think there's a, the Chieftains, I think, are involved with that. Uh, or... Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. for anybody out there that grew up with uh, John Williams' uh, Far and Away, this uh -huh. kind of it kind of serves as a companion or almost like a sequel of, of taking you back to uh, kind of like a, a sort of music with an Irish kind of yeah. an Irish country kind of flair. But, but I mean, I, I did enjoy Water Horse. I saw the film and I was like, the yeah. you know, it's charming and, and it does switch uh, tendencies or switch tones very quickly. But it's, mm -hmm. again, it's, um, it's very colorful and it's very well done. So that's cool. That's cool to know that next time I hear it, uh, you'll have, it's, yeah, you're in there. <laughs> I had my, I had my little marks in there. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, and, uh, did now I know even from ten years ago when we were talking to, uh, uh, pardon my name dropping, but I believe it was Mark Graham at the yeah Joanne Kane yeah I think he was showing us like this is what it looks like when James Newton Howard sends us something and it was like it looked like one button was pushed in it was like a MIDI button but what it actually was was like a string effect that did this sort of gliss up uh huh. And, and something to a cluster. And he said, so sometimes we have to go in and we have to get the MIDI files and listen to them and then right. look at the MIDI files to realize that's not a G. That's a crazy string glissando effect going upward. Exactly. So and I, I had to do the same thing. And that the, the mock-ups were, you know, very important in, in making sure that um, you were translating it the right way. Um, and of, of course, you know, he would approve it and then it would go off to the uh, Joanne Kane after that. Okay. So it, it's kind of a, a funny thing. You have to just the, the, it's interp you're interpreting. It's you're really interpreting. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and it's cool that you were part of that. I mean, with with uh, Howard's music, he's one of the last composers I thought that had like his own sound. Like when I hear a score of his, I know mm -hmm. exactly, like pretty much, unless the movie was heavily temped. And yes. He's, he's going for a whole different thing. I can sure. generally tell it's him and. Anyway, but that's just that's yeah, very cool. Yeah. And he's yeah, he's just he's so amazing, and, uh, and and he's very versatile too. But yeah, you he definitely has a stamp. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, you know, the stuff that he I've noticed that he's done for Shyamalan has been so sophisticated. You know, signs and um, yeah, Lady in the Water, uh, Lady in the Water in the Village. Even though the some of the films weren't so great. Something <laughs> I learned from him is that you could still make the music amazing. Yeah. yeah. Which did. I got Hilary Hahn's autograph. I'm just putting Oh, it up. nice. Yeah. It's, and, on the, it's on the booklet for um for the village. So Awesome. That's one of right. my favorites. And it was it was just really neat when I was working there and his door was open, you would hear him creating and it flew you know, floating out of the door and just his mock-ups were incredible. 
sometimes I even wondered, is there a point in even recording this? <laughs> you know? So yeah. He, he, he has, he got, I know he, he and Hans are good buddies, so he got some very good sample libraries from him. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah and, and I know this is an interview for you, and I don't mean to take the attention away from, from oh, you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but, but I think it's interesting for anyone who, we, we do sometimes have part of our audience is people maybe that are just interested in composing. And so I think it's really cool to know that you can be a professional composer and also from time to time uh, work as an orchestrator. Like we had Conrad Pope on recently, and mm -hmm. that was like fantastic to talk to him. So I think yeah. it's really cool that you're so versatile, and you've got this first part, and then the second part, and then, um, and actually, Kevin, you had um, something you wanted to ask her. Yeah. Well, I, Bill, I think you had kind of even mentioned um, either at the beginning of the interview or maybe before we even started. But uh, Julia, it sounds like sometimes you you get a chance to do some concert music. I'm just kind of wondering what kind of stuff outside of the TV stuff you've been doing recently that you've been working on. You know, I, I actually, recently, I haven't been able to do concert music. Um, it's it's been a few years. Um, I was doing a lot more of that um, in college, actually, and and um, after college. But it's really been film and and TV the last several years. But I would really like to get back into it, um, just to be able to have. Um, be able to just create music that um, is stands alone as great music, and not having. Um, I love working the film and TV, but not having the constraints of it would mm -hmm. be refreshing too. Do you have any other um, aside from Bones, like any other film stuff that you're working on, or that's coming down the pipe? Um, at, well, recently I just worked on um, a National Geographic film um, about um, elephants and the, um, the the blood ivory trade. Um, it just mm -hmm. um, was being uh, broadcast all over Southeast Asia where um, ivory is still being sold um, in, in illegal markets. And um, it was basically to spread awareness as to... Um, when you buy ivory, you're basically supporting the killing of elephants, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, and that, that's been um, a second passion of mine now, ever since my first trip to Africa two years ago. Um, so what I've been doing um, in my spare time is writing music um, for conservation-type films um, to, you know, so that... I'm able to give back musically um, to a, a cause, you know, and to raise empathy through music. And um, there, when we went to Africa two years ago, we visited this baby elephant orphanage that pretty much changed my life and my husband's too. Um, just um, meeting these baby elephants that have lost their families to the ivory trade, you know, that their families have been poached. And... Um, seeing that the species is going to, you know, they're, they're telling us the species is going to be gone in 10 years. And I, I thought this is just horrific and I wanted to help in any way I could. And, um, the organization produces these films, um, these rescue films and fundraising films, um, about how they save elephants and what, and, and what they do for conservation. And I offered my music to them just as a donation, as a way of helping, and they took me up on it. And it's just been a really nice labor of love and something different. Um, and it's just been, you know, strictly based on on wanting to make a difference for the elephants. So that's been just kind of a cool thing. We get to, I get to do like African stuff, you know, which is really fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does it look like the Lion King when you're over there? Does it look like that when the sun? It really does. Seriously, <laughs> I, it's 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 incredible. You you you're just, you know, on our last trip a few weeks ago, we came out of the tent and we saw uh, there was a watering hole there, and we would see giraffes walking by, and then an elephant, and you know, it would just keep changing all throughout the day, and it's like, wow, we don't even need to leave. We could just watch them drinking water. You know, it's it's very cool, and you really want to, you know, it's a lot of people in <laughs> in Kenya don't care about the wildlife, and that's really what is drawing tourists to come and support their economy. So it's, it's quite mm -hmm. important. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really great. Um, and it's is the organization. Is it just simply called the Elephant Orphanage? No, actually, I'm glad you asked that. It's um, the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. 
And if okay. you go there, you, you can see what they do, and, and um, you can foster a baby elephant for $50 a year. Oh, thank you. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and they also, they, they also support the community. They build schools. They take, um, they take school children to visit the elephants to educate them um, about them. And, and uh, you know, it's, it was, what's interesting is um, I was told 90% of Kenyans have never even seen an elephant. You know, and they don't even care about it and un understand why it's important to um, to value their their wildlife. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's it's a really wonderful organization, and we're very proud to be part of it. Um, so, I, if you care about elephants and want to do something, go to that site, and you'll okay. hear um, some of my music on there as well as Cody's. It's become like a joint venture, actually. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely put a link to it on our page. Yeah. Great. Um, we've got the uh, the episode finished and everything. So Great. that's really cool. Yeah. Well, Julia, uh, we don't want to keep you because you're probably going to be busy relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. It's, it's more like um, house remodel time. <laughs> yeah, it's like house remodel, software reinstall, yes. uh, some upgrades and updates, and then... Right. On with the well. Listen, best of success with the tenth season, and hopefully not final. I mean, if yeah, we'll see. We'll just keep yeah. keep doing what we're doing and hope for the best. I'll look over as I watch Homeland on Netflix. I will watch and see if you sneak over for an episode or two. Ha! That would and be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much again for uh, for speaking with us and Thanks for having me. Best of luck with all future projects, at both you and Cody, and uh, best of luck getting the second layer of your house finished. Oh, thank you. It's great <laughs> to see you again. Yeah, you too. All right. Okay. Bye. Take care. All right. Well, thanks again, Julia, for an awesome interview. It's fun talking to you and catching up with you after all that time. Um, that's going to do it for this episode of Streamers and Punches. You can listen to us on soundnotion.tv slash SAP, where you can subscribe to our show, leave comments, and find links to the music we spoke about. You can also subscribe to the show through iTunes. My name is Bill Witham. And I'm Kevin Wilt. Thank you for listening. <laughs>